All right. Um, I guess let's get started. Maybe there's a couple more folks joining us uh, who have maybe an extended lunch break. But mm -hmm. thank you so much for making it to my talk today. Um, it's called The State of Kotlin JS. Um, the content of this talk is fairly obvious because of this, right? Um, we're going to take the next around about 45 minutes just talking about um, the JavaScript target for Kotlin, where we are, um, and we'll kind of see an excerpt of what the team has planned for the future releases, um, as well as kind of in the not-so-distant future, and we'll, we'll even see some stuff that's kind of more long-term, right? So I'm, I'm trying to kind of do, do a little bit of a split during this talk, where if you're a newcomer to Kotlin.js, I hope that I can kind of get you up to speed and kind of like show you what you can try right now, um, what is maybe the, the most exciting topics. Um, if you've already tried or worked with Kotlin.js, then um, I hope that the, the second part where we talk a lot about uh, what is coming up, um, all these new and exciting changes, um, will hopefully kind of give you this, this gleeful anticipation um, and you'll, you'll also get something out of this talk. Um, kind of rude of me to not introduce myself, right? So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sebastian. I work as a developer advocate at JetBrains. I mainly actually focus on uh, topics in education, but I also, like, my, my true love is, is Kotlin. And if I get a chance to do Kotlin and the web, it kind of gives me butterflies in my stomach. Um, in fact, I personally believe that the, the JavaScript target is probably one of the more overlooked targets when, when we're talking about Kotlin multi-platform. And I still think it's one of the like, most exciting ones. And I kind of want to take you on a journey why I believe that, right? So I think it's, it's pretty undeniable that over probably the, the last decade or so, uh, JavaScript and just the web overall um, has become a really influential platform. If you're a small team, you want to quickly roll out some kind of application, um, but you don't want to care about uh, what machines people are running, kind of the go-to solution is to write a web app and just kind of push it out to as many people as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, using Kotlin to do the same thing is at least I hope uh, an exciting premise in itself. Uh, given that you folks are here, I hope I don't have to convince you about all the cool things um, we can do with Kotlin, right? Um, we can reuse all our paradigms that we know and love, um, that we kind of are already familiar with. Um, and more importantly, we can also equip ourselves with familiar tools, right? We work in the same kind of environments. This allows us to do prototypes rather quickly. Um, if we're maybe coming from the desktop world or the backend world, it, it gives us a, a really nice way into um, approaching well, front end, the browser, for example, without having to leave a language that we really enjoy. Um, and of course, the big thing uh, for, for many people is multi-platform, right? Um, there's a couple of topics that you usually hear when you, people talk about the benefits of multi-platform development, code sharing, model sharing, and probably most importantly, knowledge sharing. And all of these, of course, also apply for, for the JavaScript target, right? And um, as we'll see a little bit later, with a new platform, we also kind of gain the power of a new ecosystem. After all, it's kind of Kotlin's thing to, to really integrate uh, with the platform and not just sit on top of it and, and kind of stay, uh, stay, stay pure and away from all of this. So uh, regardless of if you're coming from maybe a mobile development background or um, a um, backend development background, I think that Kotlin.js might be pretty exciting. So uh, three parts for today. What can we do right now or in the next releases? Uh, soon, trademark pending. Um, then what can we do uh, or what is the plan of the team for the next couple of steps for uh, Kotlin.js? And then just as kind of a, a sprinkle on top, we're also going to talk about some things that are not announcements, but that are just kind of things that the team is working on. So where are we actually standing right now in regards to the, to the JavaScript target? I kind of want to take you back a little bit, because if you've tried Kotlin.js recently, like in the last couple of years, things weren't always super clear, right? Um, it, 
got kind of confusing, especially when you were just starting out. There was a ton of different approaches that kind of allowed you to target uh, JavaScript through Kotlin, but they all had, had their own quirks. They all looked a little bit different. They all had their own kind of documentation. For example, the Kotlin to JS plugin, front end plugin, all of this. So it wasn't really clear how to get started, right? The message that I can fortunately give today is that things are becoming a lot clearer um, because the future in Kotlin.js uh, lies in the context of the new Kotlin.js uh, plugin for Gradle. Um, so regardless of whether you want to do browser development or if you want to do, uh, for example, Node.js development with Kotlin, um, this plugin will be your one-stop shop. The other Gradle plugins that currently exist, um, like Kotlin 2.js, Kotlin front-end plugin, they will be deprecated sometime down the line. But, of course, there's not really any kind of need to worry, because if you are coming from those plugins, the same kind of functionality that you are used to, uh, you will also find in the new plugin, will be in the same uniform uh, Gradle DSL. And yeah, if you uh, have some kind of trouble or questions, uh, or you are, you are worried about moving to the new platform, um, then maybe come to our booth and talk to a couple of the folks from the Kotlin JS team. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to receive some exciting attention. Um, and of course, there's a, a, a second big, uh, big uh, advantage to doing the Kotlin JS plugin, and that is that if you ever decide to bring in more platforms into your project, it's going to be surprisingly easy. Um, the, the changes you actually need to make are really minimal because the DSL um, that you have for configuring builds in the Kotlin JS plugin and in the multi platform plugin are pretty much the same, which is also why in the previous graphic I kind of put the Kotlin multi platform plugin around that. Uh, to just kind of see how close this actually are. Um, on the left side, we have kind of a, a Gradle build script for just a, a browser application using the Kotlin.js plugin. And then on the right-hand side, we have the uh, multi-platform version of the same thing. And you don't actually need to read all the code. Uh, all I want you to kind of do is to map and see that the, the green part corresponds to the green part, the blue part corresponds to the blue part. So all the actually JavaScript specific stuff, you can just copy over and it works in the other context as well. And then you can continue writing some code that's specific to, to maybe other platforms or common. So the message is very clear in, in this context, right? Um, if you want to start future-proofing your project or if you are um, building a new project, then start with the new Kotlin JS plugin. Um, we actually make this also really easy. So if you are actually creating a, a new project in IntelliJ, it will also use the, the new plugin already. And of course, if you're a little bit more adventurous or already have a different platform, just go for the multi platform projects directly. All right, so let's get into kind of the, the nitty gritty of um, what makes the new uh, plugin so great. Because for that, we, we need to kind of understand that the JavaScript world usually looks a bunch different from, from what we're used to in Kotlin. Um, there's things like bundlers that perform like post-processing steps on your app. There's dependency managers like NPM, Yarn, um, and of course they have their own configuration files. Um, and there's a vast ecosystem of packages as well, right? NPM recently crossed the, the one million uh, packages barrier. So if there is a, a package that you could be thinking about right now, it probably exists on NPM. Um, us Gradle folks usually kind of have one very central uh, point, or Kotlin folks, right? We have a very central point uh, for configuration, which is our, our Gradle uh, build script. And the new plugin really tries to unite these two worlds in a way that is uh, convenient even for people who don't have previous JavaScript experience. So when you start a new project um, right now, for example, for the browser, then your uh, project will be bundled and processed by default with Webpack. Um, and th the special thing about this is it's without the hassle. I, I put this here specifically because usually when I talk to people and I tell them that something is using Webpack, they kind of have this allergic reaction to like, oh, now I have to write 200 lines of configuration code before I can actually start writing my actual business logic. Um, so. 
well, instead of kind of having to write this whole Webpack configuration yourself, um, we expose the most important parts uh, through the Gradle DSL directly. Um, and most importantly, we provide you with sensible defaults. So you can actually start running your application just from the wizard, and it will uh, run without you having to modify a thing. Of course, if you have some kind of uh, edge cases or something that's very specific to what you are trying to do, you still have full control. You can still write Webpack configuration scripts and then inject them into the, uh, into the actual build pipeline, and that works just fine. One other thing that I personally think is the most amazing about this whole thing is that it's fully managed. So what I, what I mean by this is that you don't actually have to set up a JavaScript development environment to use this Gradle plugin. So you don't have to install Yarn. You don't have to set up any kind of paths. You don't have to um, set up any kind of like specifics. And, well, so and you still get all the functionality that we're gonna look at in, in a little bit, right? So we have a Yarn distribution. We get the plugin files automatically generated, package JSON, uh, our Webpack configuration. All of it is just done for us. This might not actually sound all that exciting in the first moment, but if you keep in mind that this whole solution is multi uh, is is also like uh, for for every platform, right? So on Windows, Linux, uh, Mac OS, it actually has saved my butt a couple of times uh, when I wanted to show something to a friend who was working on a Windows machine. I'm not an avid Windows user, so setting up like npm and all this kind of stuff, it would have taken me at least half an hour, maybe more. This way single click application springs to life and everything is fine. Um, yeah, so even the way that we manage dependencies for, for JavaScript is, is actually handled in this context. So when we put dependencies in our uh, Gradle file, then the package JSON file, which, which Yarn then uses in the build process, is actually automatically updated and kind of reflects the exact same changes. Um, now, something that we've uh, maybe seen before uh, already at the keynote, but I kind of still want to talk about it a little bit, um, is the Webpack dev server. Now, in general, the Webpack dev server is just this neat little tool that allows you to just spin up a, a local server and, and quickly get your, um, get your application running so you can just test it locally. Um, but the real potential we can actually unfold by running the application uh, it with the continuous flag in Gradle, right? Because that, in turn, turns on a file system watcher, which then, uh, every time a file changes, runs the specific Gradle task, invokes the Kotlin compiler, uh, which runs the Webpack dev server, um, and that actually triggers, for example, your Chrome browser to reload. So all of this happens rather quickly. Um, so whenever you make even a small change to your code, um, it reflects immediately in the browser. So, yeah, of course, you don't have to do it via the, the command line. There's also an option to just run this in the, um, in the run configuration inside IntelliJ. Um, another big topic that I kind of want to talk about is source maps. Because uh, whenever code breaks or we kind of want to inspect code that's actually running, uh, it's important that we have tools that kind of support us support us with this and that allow us to kind of pinpoint the correct locations, right? Um, as of Kotlin 1360, so already, um, the source maps are actually automatically generated for uh, any code that's targeting uh, JavaScript, either for Node.js or the browser, um, through the new plugin. So when we are doing Node.js, this just gives us nice, nicer stack traces. Um, and if we are doing uh, the browser, then this actually unlocks a bunch of new superpowers from the, from the dev tools of our respective browser, right? So if I open the console, for example, let's say I've built a small Pong game or something like that, um, and I open the browser, uh, I, open, I, I right click and inspect, and I can see well, maybe some debug messages, and most importantly, I can see that this actually references a Kotlin file. So when I click this, I actually get Kotlin uh, directly inside the, the tools, the, the dev tools of my browser. And of course, these are also interactive, right? So we can set breakpoints. We can even set uh, like sub-statement breakpoints. You can see here with the small blue markers, uh, we get information about the scope that we are in. Um, and I just found it particularly charming that every execution step actually also shows the values um, that a certain variable has at a current point. 
So um, this feature actually also helps with the implementation of uh, the next point or the next functionality, and that is uh, testing because we can also use the Gradle DSL to set up, for example, platform-specific test runners, Karma, Mocha, something like this. Um, we have very fine-grained control over how and where we want these tests to be executed. So if you want to run them in Internet Explorer, Firefox, or a headless Chrome, we can simply specify this in our build script inside the test task, um, and the Karma test runner will just work its magic. Um, I personally really like this feature because it always kind of feels, makes me feel a little bit like a hacker because I press one button and all of a sudden all these windows start spawning and everything is like remote controlled and then they pop down again and ideally it says 100% success. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it also looks like this with 0% uh, success. Um, but this is uh, just my, my segue to the next point, which is that we have these really nice Gradle test reports, which uh, once again, they integrate with, uh, with the stack traces. So you can see when something breaks, in what line it has actually uh, broken, what uh, method you were currently in, and what, what caused the issue, right? So all of this is, is kind of very nicely integrated. It's, it's really easy to navigate. It's just an HTML page you can open afterwards, and you get all the information. So all of the things that I've kind of talked about for now was really about writing Kotlin code and then running that on, on JavaScript interpreters. But really, we also want to interact with the platforms, right? So um, we have this huge cornucopia of, of uh, libraries, packages. And yeah, since Kotlin's thing is really to interop, let's talk about that for a while. So there has already been uh, in the Kotlin standard library um, type safe wrappers for browser APIs for a while now. So these are actually generated from the W3C standards, and we can uh, use those to very easily just kind of interact with the browser. I've brought an example that we're going to look at in, in just a second. They're statically typed, so they kind of bridge this gap between, between JavaScript and Kotlin very nicely. Um, and they have the big benefit that they are generated from official specifications, which means that you can actually go on, for example, the Mozilla Developer Network, and you can just read about, well, for example, an HTML canvas element. You can look at its API there, see all the little quirks that it maybe has, um, and you can map this pretty much one-to-one -one into your Kotlin code. So I actually followed a couple of their tutorials, and all I had to do was uh, make sure that we are on, on the type safe side, we do a couple of casts. Apart from that, we actually get the, the kind of same functionality and even similar syntax to what we have in JavaScript. So an example for this uh, is just these like 20 odd lines of code, right? Um, they use uh, JavaScript APIs or browser APIs like get element by ID. Um, then we make sure that stuff is uh, properly typed and kind of in order. And then we can actually use stuff like the, the with syntax or repeat, so all the typical Kotlin constructs that we hopefully know and love. Um, and within, yeah, 20 lines of code, we can already uh, bring a couple of like mosaic-looking uh, colorful squares into the browser. And this is something that I personally always really loved because I write a lot of small demo code or I want to explore some weird topic or visualization. And the one thing I usually don't want to do is I don't want to spend half an hour pulling in 10 dependencies and reading some kind of documentation about when a repaint event might happen. So instead of having to do all of that, maybe on, on like the JVM or with Swing or, or JavaFX, um, Kotlin.js really gives me the, the opportunity to uh, use probably one of the most like tutorial oversaturated APIs that we have out there um, to just kind of very quickly get started and, and build these things, all without having to actually leave the language that I want to write. Um, we can expand this a little bit to like a um, hundred something lines of code, and we can write some kind of physics simulation, which I'm personally very proud of because it showed me that uh, after studying, I hadn't forgotten everything about linear algebra, and I can still still build some stuff. But out of these 158 lines of code, probably 20 or 30 are actually responsible for for rendering, and the rest of it is like literally just the the actual the logic. Um, and a couple of data classes for vectors, operations, all these kind of things. It's dependency-free. Um, it, I'm not sure if it shows properly here, but it runs at 
an easy 60 frames per second, and it just really helps me build these kind of prototypes in an easy fashion. Um, these browser API declarations have been uh, in the in, with each Kotlin JS version. They've just been uh, shipped with each Kotlin version, right? Um, but since browser APIs maybe change on a different schedule, or we have improvements that are not strictly coupled to the actual Kotlin releases, these are uh, will be kind of encapsulated now by the team as a separate artifact that. It doesn't really make that much of a difference because you can just pull it in from uh, from your Gradle, and you will get this exact same functionality. We also now have pretty much uh, very shortly uh, ago brought out type safe access to the Node.js platform. So all the platform specific APIs that we have there um, are also available, and this is by default just a another Gradle um, package that you can pull in uh, another artifact, and you'll be able to use all of this from Kotlin as well. Um, yeah, since we are already on the context of bringing in dependencies, right, um, we have a couple of libraries that we, we know and love, and if you've maybe done something like create React Kotlin app or something, you may have run into the problem that certain libraries actually needed to be published on NPM for you to be able to use them, and some of the libraries weren't actually available at all. Fortunately, now that we kind of have a Gradle build system again, this kind of problem just evaporates, right? So if you want to do call an X serialization, coroutines, or, or KTOR clients, you can do all of that uh, with the new plugin with, without bigger issues, right? So you literally just import them, uh, you import their um, JavaScript version and their core version, and it just works out. This even works for plugins that have uh, that require compiler plugins, right? So, for example, Kotlin X serialization also works wonderfully, though, of course, with the current backend, a specific version of the plugin had to be provided for, for this target. And vice versa, of course, you kind of want to bring in all the JavaScript stuff into Kotlin. Um, there's a bunch of, of libraries that we know and love and also use at JetBrains. Um, React, Router, Redux, Styled Components, some others. And we actually publish wrappers for those to make it easier to, well, use them directly, right? So once again, pull in a Gradle dependency and you are set. But usually when people are building a React application, they don't build just a pure React app. Um, they want to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? They want to pull in some, some other dependencies. Um, I've already spoiled this a little bit, um, but NPM dependencies can be uh, imported just in the same way. So if you have a, a source set, you can just say, in my dependencies, I want to have an NPM package. Uh, for example, here we have React minimal pie chart or React spin kit. And the magic that happens in the background will automatically update your package JSON file, make sure that this is available at runtime. Now, in an ideal world, we would, of course, now immediately be able to use all this functionality f straight from Kotlin. So we would be able to draw some kind of pie charts immediately and get some nice loading spinners, this kind of thing. But again, there's kind of this, this bridge that we need to kind of cross, um, or the, the gap we need to bridge, um, which is between the dynamic world of JavaScript and the statically typed world of Kotlin. So this is typically done via external declarations, which can just kind of uh, specify, OK, these are the things that are available, um, and I would like to use them. So in this example, I'm actually kind of using a cop-out because I'm using the, the platform-specific dynamic type. Um, and this kind of just makes the compiler say, eh, I guess, I guess you know what you're doing. I'm not going to check this. It saves me having to write out specific, uh, like all the specific kind of uh, signatures that I would otherwise have to use. Um, in this kind of small package, it's not really that big of a problem. Uh, there's just a name and a color. Um, and how I find that out is I go, I go to the documentation and I see what kind of properties I can feed in. Um, and I can just use this. But I still don't get any kind of tooling support. And if I want to do it properly, I would have to, to actually specify um, all the combinations. And this is fine for, for two, three methods. But then the other, um, the other React component that I showed, which was the minimal pie chart, their documentation looks a little bit like this. So there's a couple of things. And then you know you have to actually 
write a lot of code, and this kind of gets in the way, right? We want to use the components. We don't want to fight with the Kotlin compiler, trying to figure out where does which annotation go, how does a certain thing map into the, into the Kotlin world, um, all these kind of things. And especially if we are actually coming from a JVM world and don't have any kind of JavaScript experience, uh, it gets even more confusing. Like, what is required JS? When what's actually the difference between AMD, UMD? Why do I need to use this annotation and not the other one? Um, it kind of makes it feel like a dark art. So. The Kotlin JS team obviously has also figured out that this is a, a kind of a headache inducer for people. Um, and yeah, there is a solution on the way. And if we are a little bit brave, we can actually try this already today. Because the, the good thing about the JavaScript ecosystem is that there is a de facto standard for writing external declarations uh, for, for packages. And those are TypeScript declarations. So if a package is already written in TypeScript, then they just natively have these kind of type safe headers, right? And if the package is actually not written in TypeScript itself, there's usually community contributed um, type safe headers that can then be used. And there's this new Ducat project, which has also been mentioned briefly in the keynote beforehand, um, which allows the automatic conversion of uh, TypeScript declaration files uh, into Kotlin external declarations. So it replaces the, the previous attempts of doing, for example, TS2, KT, um, and all of these things. Well, and it just makes it really convenient to um, kind of use the headers, right? Because the integration actually looks deceptively simple. The same line I've showed beforehand where you just import an NPM project uh, or an NPM package, you can, uh, it, when Ducat is enabled, it will automatically generate the correct headers for you. It is currently an experimental stage, um, but you can already try it out. So if you have a look at the blog post for, I believe, 1360, there's an example project that kind of shows you how you can actually use uh, Ducat already nowadays. And I would, of course, very much encourage you to do this, even though there's a lot of places where Ducat might break. Um, now is the best time to kind of give feedback and tell the team, oh, uh, this is maybe a library that is more important to me than 10 other libraries. Let's uh, focus on, on having this supported first. Um, Ducat is actually already really powerful, uh, but it's currently still working behind the scenes. So um, we already briefly talked about the, the browser APIs and the Node.js APIs, and those are actually generated through Ducat. And the same mechanism will be expanded to, well, pretty much all NPM packages somewhere down the line. So the way that um, the, let's see here, sorry. Um, Let's actually kind of have a, have a look at how this, uh, how this integrates. Um, we're going to maybe have a peek at under the hood what happens when you import probably one of the most notorious uh, JavaScript packages, uh, LeftPad. Um, it, LeftPad just has, um, is actually written in JavaScript, but it has TypeScript headers, uh, which look a little bit like this. Um, so maybe some noteworthy things are maybe the union types that we don't have in, uh, in the Kotlin type system, which allow you to specify these great statements like the variable string can be a string or a number. Amazing. Um, anyway, Ducat kind of transforms all of these uh, definitions into the, into the correct external definitions for Kotlin. Um, they're all annotated as external. I just cut that so you can actually read it properly um, and all annotate them with the, with the correct module. So and you, as you can see, there's, there's a bunch of actual like overloads here. Um, so for the optional parameters as well as for the union types. And we can kind of actually bring, bring a lot of the, the TypeScript type system and map it into, well, the Kotlin type system. So we end up with a very nice uh, call site from, uh, from Kotlin that is type safe, where we get autocomplete everything we would probably want. And last but not least, of course, uh, the, the, the most, probably the most important thing about this whole conversion process is that the warning to not use left pad doesn't actually vanish in the process. We still kind of get nudged into the direction and say, like, maybe it's not such a great idea to use this package anymore. So this is kind of the conclusion of what is currently available. So if you are like literally now opening a, an IntelliJ, you can try all of this already. Um, 
But of course, the Kotlin JS journey is not done yet. Um, let's move on to the kind of next exciting chapter and see where Kotlin is uh, or Kotlin JS is headed. Um, we can actually start off right where we where we left off, uh, and that is Ducat. Ducat supports more packages in uh, in the next releases, of course, and we really try to prioritize this uh, with the um, in in conjunction with the community. In fact, two of the gentlemen who are working on Ducat are sitting literally across from me in my, uh, in my office. So maybe it would be a, a really nice holiday or Christmas present for, for all of you folks to try it out, see what breaks, and you know, submit a ton of reproducible bug reports uh, so that we can kind of get Ducat to a state where it's really nice and pleasant to use. Um, there's a couple of, of bigger changes that are also coming um, and, well, the biggest one is probably the support for the IR backend. Because regardless of whether you're targeting Node.js or the browser, um, the Kotlin JS plugin will get support for the new backend, which is based on the Kotlin specific intermediate representation. Um, so this IR will help obviously in many ways, uh, lays the foundation for a bunch of different benefits. And I really don't want to get lost in kind of the details of how you will have to like slightly adjust your code or uh, when you can actually like where you should start using it. Um, instead, I just kind of want to give a, a very high level overview um, to kind of Get, like wet your appetite and uh, see how um, what kind of benefits we can expect, right? Because I think that the Kotlin intermediate representation um, will definitely make your life better. So, what kind of benefits can we expect? First of all, there's something that's actually not specific to uh, the to the JavaScript world, and that is the multi-platform compiler plugins. So, with an intermediate representation that is agnostic from the actual um, target that you are uh, approaching, you can write platform agnostic plugins, and more importantly, because these plugins will not be have to be rewritten for each and every target, we can consume these platform ag agnostic plugins. Um, so uh, we kind of also have planned sometime down the line to get hopefully a well-structured API that will uh, make it possible for, for plugin authors to really rely on this functionality um, and make the, the plugins a lot more robust to change. But JavaScript specifically, um, the new backend really allows to do more aggressive optimizations, especially in regards to code size. So on the topic, for example, of uh, dead code elimination beforehand, you were kind of forced to maybe ship a, a full standard library um, just to, to get everything accessible. And this is not actually the case anymore with the new backend. And this actually really shows. So let's have a look at maybe just some numbers. I'm not going to go through the details here. But you can see that uh, for our example project, which, uh, which uses uh, coroutines and Kotlin X, HTML, a couple of other things. Uh, in the current backend, we are getting a lot larger numbers for the actual code size as compared to the IR backend, even um, in every optimization stage. And, well, probably the coolest thing is that the new, new backend works extremely well with the Google Closure compiler. So at that point, if we actually feed the, the code through the IR backend, then the dead code elimination, and then through the, the Google Closure compiler, we can, we can push the, the zipped uh, file size down to 30 kilobytes for something that, well, maybe a while ago was still 3.9 megabytes. So I'm personally very excited about that. I'm also very happy to say that the team has assured me that uh, with the new backend, compilation speeds will be from scratch at least as fast as with the current backend, at least as fast, obviously implying um, that there will be parts or, or that there are parts that are already faster and that things will only get speedier. Now, incremental compilation allows us to compile only those parts that are actually affected by changes. Um, which, if you think back to this Gradle auto reload thing, will make sure that the page reloads for those continuous builds are also just going to end up a lot faster. And I think that's going to make it even more fun to, to iterate on, on my small example projects, for example. In the context of kind of maybe hybrid apps as well, um, 
the new backend enables the possibility to easily expose our exported Kotlin signatures as actual TypeScript headers and uh, in the form of JS doc. So it's kind of the counterpart to, to what Ducat is trying to do, right? Um, and this is really interesting because on the one hand, it, um, I'm very sorry. There we go. Um, on the one hand, it allows us to um, make it a lot easier to use the, um, the Kotlin libraries, for example, from, from a JavaScript target, but it also allows, for example, static analyzers to reason about uh, your code in a, in a very convenient fashion. Um, and if you are using a JavaScript IDE, for example, like WebStorm, uh, that uses JS doc or the DTS files to provide you with autocomplete, then when you're writing JavaScript, you also get these for your Kotlin code. So for this, we can obviously then also, so yeah, this will hopefully give us more fun in hybrid apps. We can also look very quickly behind the scenes on, on this topic. So here I just have a small Kotlin class, which is a to-do item, just has an ID, some text, um, a completed flag, and, and a function. Now in the new backend, we mark this with a JS export uh, annotation, which tells the compiler, hey, throw us uh, maybe some, some type signatures, and this is what we actually get from it. So you can see that from the constructor to the actual complete function inside the class, everything is mapped very nicely into, into, uh, into TypeScript. And the same thing is, of course, not only available for classes, but also for, um, for values or for top-level functions, and all of this works just fine. So, if you would ask me, I would already say this is some like very exciting stuff. Then again, some might argue that is also part of my job. Um, so let's kind of still talk a little bit about the stuff that needs to be done from your side um, to to move to I to IR. Um, good news first: um, mo moving to IR will be very easy for for most folks, and it will just work out of the box. But it means like the switch means that there's kind of a change in worlds, right? So in the current, the old backend, so to say, um, there's something called the open world assumption. It doesn't really matter what this means on a technical level, but one of the effects that this has is that all your public declarations are actually exported to the JavaScript world and can be used from the JavaScript world. It's a couple of other internal parts that aren't this important in the context. Um, in the new IR backend, there is kind of this, this closed world assumption, uh, which because it will not actually export all your functionality by default, uh, just because it's public, it means that if you're doing interop or if you have some, if you're working with certain libraries, um, some action might be required. So for example, you need to manually export your declarations. Um, and the other point is, of course, that there is uh, currently no binary compatibility planned between the two backends. So if you want to import a library, um, then you will have to, well, use an IR compatible library. So for libraries that we build at JetBrains, for example, you're obviously going to receive those IR art artifacts that super speedily. Um, if you are a library maintainer yourself, then you will just have to recompile your, your library with the, with, the back end, uh, with the new backend. If you want to have more details about this, I'm not sure that applies to everyone here. Um, I would once again just encourage you to talk to a couple of the folks at the booth. Once again, I think they'll be very excited. Um, there's a bunch of adventures uh, awaiting here. So, how do we actually try, or when can we try the IR support? Well, in 1.3.70, uh, there will already be pre-alpha um, IR support. So that just means that you can still expect things to break, obviously, but there will be a flag that you can set in your, in your project and to switch it over to the new backend and to just kind of explore some of the goodies uh, we've, we've spoken about beforehand. So I would just encourage you to look at the EAP releases and also the release blog post where the, the specific flags or what you need to do uh, will actually be mentioned. Um, yeah, so speaking also of kind of the adventures that you might have with the new IIR, um, I kind of wanted to finish out on the things um, that 
well, maybe are a bit further in the future that don't have any kind of certain release date or where maybe no one even knows if they will ever come. But I wanted to kind of just bring them onto your radar so that when you're already, you know, working with a platform and you have this great idea of like, hey, maybe this will be something that the team should look into. There's, I've, I've put some of the things up on the slide um, just to kind of calm your nerves and say like, hey, they're already looking at it. So one of the parts, of course, is when, you, when you're working together with JavaScript, um, it would be very nice to be kind of up to date, use ECMAScript 6 modules um, for importing the library in kind of an idiomatic fashion. And having Kotlin.js target ES6 would certainly enable this kind of functionality. Then the other big point is, of course, framework support. Um, well, we do. I've, I've mentioned the wrappers for, for example, React, um, because we, we use and develop those uh, inside JetBrains. There's a couple of other wildly popular frameworks like Angular or, or Vue.js. And of course, you can already use interoperability with, with JavaScript to kind of share some data models or something like this. But there's no, no real first class support for these specific frameworks. So, one of the, the challenges that we have there is that the, um, usually the frameworks bring around their own kind of tooling. They maybe bring around their own kind of transpiler, compiler, something like this. Um, so there is some additional work that needs to be done to actually support them in, in a way that's, that's very nice to use. So once again, no promises, but it is on, on the radar of the team and they're kind of brainstorming about how these things could be best supported. And of course, as the small cherry on top, uh, as one of my very last slides, I wanted to name drop well, one of the, the big technologies, the, the buzzwords, um, that is WebAssembly, right? So the new backend makes it easier for the team to evaluate WebAssembly as, as a new target for, for Kotlin JavaScript and just to bring Kotlin into the browser, right? So once again, no promises here at all, no deadlines, no ETAs, but the team certainly hasn't forgotten that these kind of technologies exist. So let's round it out. If you're anything like me, I, if, if, like, if I sit in such a talk, I always get very giddy. I want to I wanna start writing things. I want to start experiencing things on my own. Um, so what can we actually do right now? We have, uh, first of all, learning materials online. There's a couple of them. But if you are actually, well, physically in this room right now, I would invite you to uh, come win some stuff. Because we have at the Kotlin booth, the um, code quiz setup. And code quiz is a Kotlin JS application that we've written in an internal hackathon just a couple of months back. Um, and you can just answer a couple of questions and win awesome prizes, which, as far as I know, are exclusive to this Kotlin conf. We'll also publish very soon a new hands on on play.kotlinlang.org, which will kind of outline the, the functionality that I've also touched upon in this talk and kind of serves as a jumping off point for you to explore these things more. Um, and of course, before, before we end this, I, I have one, one request for you, and that is to influence the development. And the only way that you can influence the development is by trying out what we have, right? So check it out, see what breaks, and bring some, some reports to, to the actual team. Um, they're more than excited to see where you would be interested in using it, and we're really excited to kind of work together with the community. Um, so I hope I was able to at least kind of instill in you the, the same, same kind of feeling that I had a couple of years back when I first saw Kotler running in the browser. Um, yeah, and there's only one more thing. At this point, as with all sessions, please remember to vote on the talk because, yeah, just with everything that involves the community, it's the only th way that we can improve and make things better over time. So thank you so much for coming around. Um, feel free to find me at the booth afterwards, um, and I'll be happy to chat. All right, thank you so much.